So welcome everyone. Thank you. It's 11 o'clock, so we're going to get started on time. Uh, welcome. My name is Monique Gray Smith, and my traditional name is Mystique Washkigos. Uh, translated from Nihawayan to English means little drum. And I'm grateful to be with you this morning and to be with Nicole. And I'll turn it over for a moment for her to introduce herself as well before we get started and welcome you again. Yate, everybody. Nicole Neidhart Yanashia, Kiaani Neshla, Bilagana Bashashin, Do Sinejini Dashache, Do Bilagana Dashamela. Hi, my name is Nicole Neidhart, and I am Dana or Navajo on my mom's side and a blend of European ancestry on my dad's side. And uh, that was me just introducing myself in Navajo and sharing my clans and kinship relations. Um, but yeah, it's just very exciting to be here with you all today and talk about this project. Um, so I can't wait. <laughs> me too. I don't know if it's this. If, it, if you could just, there we go, thank you. We're coming to you today from the traditional territories of the Tawa people. No, I want to say Tawa because in my language that means like welcome, like there's always room in the circle, but I know I just did not say that correctly. So I'm going to turn it back to Nicole. <laughs> it's the Tewa people that were on their traditional territories today. And um, that's the traditional territories here in Santa Fe, New Mexico, um, which is where I grew up and where Monique is currently visiting me, which is so special. And uh, yeah, it's just such a privilege to be able to grow up and live in such a stunning place. Yeah. And we invite you just to take a moment and look out the window or close your eyes and offer gratitude to those who've been the caretakers and the stewards and really the lovers of the land and the water and the stars and all of the medicines of the area where you live to just take that moment to offer gratitude. Mm, thank you for that. And those of you who have just joined us, we've been inviting people as they've been joining to, in the chat, share where they're coming from. Uh, if you're coming as part of a class, we have a number of classes that have joined us today, as well as if you're joining by yourself or with your family. And if you could share a couple of things you're grateful for in the chat. As I said uh, at the beginning, my English name is Monique Gray Smith, and my family comes from Treaty 4. My mom is from Papikasi's First Nation in the Capel Valley. My grandfather was Noel Cardinal. He was born Noel Shavetail, and then kin adopted by Frank Cardinal and Mary Fayant. And my dad has Lakota and Scottish ancestries. And my wife Rhonda is joining us virtually here somewhere from the Lakwangan and West Sandwich territories today, Rhonda. And uh, I have twins who are 18 and the greatest gifts that I've ever been blessed with. <laughs> yeah. So I, we've been working on this book now for the adaptation since me, since middle of August. And Nicole's come on about the end of September. Yeah, something like that. And um, could you bring us back to the main screen? Yes. Awesome, thank you. Definitely. And so we're going to each share with you a little bit of our journey of the adaptation. But we also have, and I just want to check, we also have an individual who's joining us, and I'm not sure if they're here yet. I don't think quite yet. I don't believe so. Okay, so we'll leave that for a moment. Yes. <laughs> but we're going to get started. So... I first read Braiding Sweetgrass in 2015, and I remember seeing it in a bookstore. And for me, sweetgrass is a medicine that resonates and lands so deeply for me. In the teachings that I've received, it's a woman's medicine. And whenever I smell it, whether it's the braid, whether it's growing on the land, or Nicole and I just smudged, it's like I feel 
my cells change. I feel how I vibrate in the world changes. And so when I saw a book called Braiding Sweetgrass, I was like, I got to pick that book up. <laughs> and I brought it home and I read it. I read the prologue immediately. And then I had to put it down and let all of what I had just read find its rightful place because there's so much in that book. And in the first, like that first little piece, it was like, okay, like how do I, how do I find, let everything find its rightful place? And over the years, I kept coming back to that book. And a couple of years ago, a friend of mine, Tracy Sorrell, who many of you will know her writing, she's got beautiful children's picture books. We are grateful, we are still here. Um, middle readers, um, unclassified. I'm using the other couple titles, but she's got a number of titles. She reached out to me and said, "Can I put your name forward as to potentially adapt Braiding Sweetgrass for young adults?" And I was like, <laughs> "I didn't really have a response. I was a little overwhelmed at the thought of that." And I said, "Okay," because I'm like doors open and we get to choose whether we walk through or not and walking through that first door didn't necessarily mean it was actually going to happen there were still a lot of steps to unfold and it was almost two years later from that first conversation that Learner Books who is publishing the young adult adaptation of Braiding Sweetgrass originally written by Robin Wall Kimmerer reached out to me and with a very tight timeline so I started to break the book down in chunks. So each section, I would go through each chapter, read it, and then I would listen to it again. And those of you who might have listened to it, you know Robin reads it, and she has this beautiful incantation and cadence. And it's kind of like, for me, like sitting at the feet of an elder and listening and so I would read a chapter and then I'd work in the garden or go for a walk and listen to it again. And then the next day I would begin thinking, okay, what of this chapter can we keep for young readers? And I couldn't say the word cut because it feels to me like what we're working on is sacred text. And to say cut felt disrespectful. So in my mind, I'm like, what are we saving for the young readers to read when they get older and want to read the full manuscript? Mm -hmm. And then I created all these white flip charts in my office. And as I began to break down the chapters, the purple kind of pastel-y ones were indigenous wisdom. The pink was scientific knowledge and green was wisdom of the plants. Mm -hmm. And I had to make sure that in each section, there was a balance of those that was going to be in the adaptation. So that's how that process started. And then once the outline went to Robin and to Shana, the editor at Learner, Shana Olmanson, then I got the feedback, we're going forward. And then it really began the work about how do I take this beautiful piece and bring down some of the content from about 140,000 words to maybe about 50,000 words. So that's been the joy, and it really does feel like joy. That's the truth. When I get up in the morning and it's a braiding sweetgrass work day for me, it doesn't feel like work. I go into my office with my coffee and my water. I smudge with sweetgrass, and I feel joy working on this piece and privilege and honor. And so this morning I submitted the last section of braiding sweetgrass for the first drafts mm -hmm. and then there'll be more work for sure once Shana does the edits there'll be more work for me for sure but that first chunk has been done and I don't know what else to say except for like I can hardly wait for the young readers to be absorbed in these teachings the teachings that Robin shares of indigenous wisdom the scientific knowledge and the wisdom of the plants and that these young readers and some of not so young readers who are joining us who are like, I need, I need 
other ways to, act, to enter this text. For me too as an adult to enter the text in other ways as well. To know that there's potential to change paths forward. That these young people have the potential to change our world. And the decisions that they'll make when they get into positions of power will potentially be different because of their love for the land and their water and the water and the stars for all living being for key as robin says in the book and for an understanding of the gifts that they've been blessed with and how to use those gifts and their dreams for good and the responsibility of that and to me it chokes me up quite often, to be honest with you. I get quite teary thinking about the possibility of change and the hope. Mm -hmm. And to be able to work with Nicole on this project is a gift for me, for sure. Because some of you will know her illustrations and her work. If you haven't visited her website, please do so. If you're looking for <laughs> holiday gifts, check out Etsy. <laughs> but also she's going to show you one of the first illustrations for Braiding Sweetgrass for Young Adults. Yeah. Our, our special guest is Ooh. on. Do you want to say hello? <laughs> so we have, um, we have a special guest joining us today as well. We do indeed. <laughs> so maybe if the tech person, if you could um, bring Robin Wall Kimmerer to the front of the screen for everyone, please. Oh my gosh, you can see people's re reactions right now. <laughs> Much gratitude, Robin, for joining us today. Bonjour, sisters. Um, I am so delighted to be able to drop by your kitchen table and, <laughs> and, and, and join the discussion. Um, I, it, it's a thrill for me to, to be, well, in the same little Zoom boxes with you all. <laughs> And oh my goodness, Monique, listening to you talk about this brings tears to my eyes as well. Mm. You know, the, the opportunity in your capable hands of, of giving this gift to young people um, means so much. Um, it is, it, it's our, our work for intergenerational knowledge sharing, isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. This is what we're supposed to be doing to walk side by side with with our young people as we as we care for the for all of the gifts that are around us and um, and I'm just so excited for what will emerge from this and for the gifts of getting to work with the with the two of you and making this a reality. So mm -hmm. can I also say that in our conversations, Monique, I've I've been um, so gratified by the way that you're doing this work of, of, of thinking, it feels to me like sort of that you're polishing the gift, sculpting the gift, not cutting or anything like that, but sculpting the gift in mm. such a way that it really can be received. So uh, miigwech for that. Mm. And I'll just sit back and listen. I'm <laughs> glad to be here with you. And, and I'm sorry, I apologize for this funky view. I am at my office and the, the webcam here is very strange. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for joining us because mm -hmm. Nicole and I said, yeah, let's do this. And we thought maybe 20, 25 people would join us and, <laughs> yeah. you know, over 250 <laughs> registered. And I know a lot of them are classes, so I don't know how many are actually with us. And so I had reached out to Robin saying, might you be able to join us? And this morning she emailed back saying, ha, like, I thought it was a couple of collaborators around the table. And we're like, that's what we thought it was going to be too. You're going to need a bigger teapot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And more cookies. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, so much gratitude again. And yeah. let's hear from Nicole and her, yeah. her journey with us so far. Thank you. Well, Robin, it's so lovely to meet you over Zoom. <laughs> I almost feel like I've gotten to know you a little bit through listening to the book in the last 
few months as I've been kind of revisiting it. Um, Cause like the audio book for me has just been really kind of healing to listen to while I start to think about the illustrations and the illustrations that will be in the book. Um, so it's just really lovely to meet you today, just to say that to start. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I thought so today. I thought um, I am going to be showing a little um, preview of one of the... Oh, <laughs> of one of the um, sketches that I've done that will be an interior illustration piece within the book. Um, but before I kind of show you that, I just thought I'd share a little bit about my process so far um, as the illustrator for such an amazing book and adaptation and just the kind of responsibility that brings to the work. Um, you know, me and Monique were just talking the other day that we almost feel like this is like a sacred text <laughs> because it has so many teachings that are within it. And when I think about all of those teachings and how they're so kind of prevalent within so many Indigenous communities, um, you know, they resonate so much with me as a Navajo person. Um, I was just thinking how important it is that the illustrations really kind of can capture the essence of those teachings and share them in like a slightly different way than words do. Um, and the way I like to think about my illustration practice is every kind of visual element that makes up an image is a story. And um, with a book that's full of so many different stories, it kind of fits really well that for my illustrations, each image is like a collection of stories as well. Um, and I'll kind of elaborate on what I mean by that when I show the image. Um, actually, should we just do it now? Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> let's see. Um, we'll share a screen. Oh, wait. Okay, so this is one of the first illustrations that I've done. Um, it's going to be an interior illustration piece that goes for the chapter Asters and Goldenrod. Um, and it's that moment when um, baby Robin sees <laughs> Asters and Goldenrod for the first time. And that kind of magical moment of seeing that beautiful pairing of um, the yellow and the purple and... Um, so this is still just a sketch. It's not the final art form yet, but um, as you can see, I have like a mom and baby with like the blanket falling away and looking upon these plants for the first time with this kind of wonder. And um, when I talk about like all the little stories that I'm trying to capture within uh, each illustration, um, it's like every single component has a little story that can be found within the actual chapter. So obviously the main focus is the asters and goldenrod. Um, but then I also included these little pollinator bees, right? Because that was talked about in the chapter and how um, they can see these contrasting colors and that's why they grow together and live together. And so um, by bringing in all those little moments and details and elements trying to really capture like the richness and beauty of the teachings um so i'm really happy that i can share this with you today um and just to talk a little bit more about like the way i even like come upon a design like this um for maybe this will be really interesting for like the classes that have joined if there's any artists um, any youth artists who are in those classes, like it takes a lot of planning to create an image like this. And um, it takes a lot of dreaming and brainstorming. Um, you know, I work with the art director from Learner Publishing, uh, Danielle Carnido, and um, she gives me like little kind of almost like drawing prompts, I would say. Like it's drawing out like an image or um, a section from the text that Monique has sent in and I get to see the chapters. So I read through them. Um, and then I kind of have this like focus that the publisher has given me to kind of um, create the image on. Um, 
But then from that, I have to start kind of dreaming about like, okay, what's the composition? Um, how are all the images throughout the whole book going to tie together? So I have to start, what I'm starting to do now is starting to create little thumbnail images that will be the chapter art for every single chapter because there's going to be an illustration that goes with every single chapter. So there's going to be like 26, 27 mm -hmm. illustrations, something like that in total. So it's quite a lot of work, <laughs> but um, it's really exciting work. And just like Monique said, I feel really like blessed and lucky to be able to do this for work because it just feels like such a special project. And um, I just really do feel that responsibility to like really give it my all and make sure these illustrations really capture those teachings. Um, yeah, and also all of them will be in black and white um, because this is a, you know, like a, a young adult chapter book format. It's not like a picture book um, where there'd be like these full spread color illustrations. Um, because, you know, there's so many different considerations in creating a book, but um, for these illustrations, they'll be black and white. We might include one or two colors, we'll see, but um, it creates another challenge, right? Like, I can't draw on color to kind of get the message across. I really have to focus on um, the images I'm using, um, the shading and depth, and also realizing they'll be quite small. So just thinking about all those considerations when thinking about how to make an impactful image for people that can help them kind of delve deeper into what they're reading. So, And I love, yeah. thank you for talking about the delving deeper, because even as this image has been up, I've seen it off and on for maybe almost a month now. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just noticing for the first time, and this is, I think, something that especially educators who use this book um, that you can ask students and we can ask it of ourselves, what do you see in the image? Mm -hmm. And for the first time I'm seeing almost like a heart that holds, <laughs> right? The, the asters and goldenrod as shaped as a heart holding baby Robin and her mom. I love that you picked up on that. <laughs> Cause that was so intentional. So that's so mm. cool. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, totally. And I I guess I also wanted to say that like I was thinking a lot about just how important our plant relatives are and um in thinking about illustrating plants that will be throughout the book in various different um forms like I was really trying to make sure that I was thinking about illustrating these plants not as like these like pretty details that elaborate or um, that kind of accentuate a piece, but like almost the plants themselves are portraits. Mm. So really acknowledging um, like each plant's like agency and existence in the world and honoring that by making sure the plants feel like portraits themselves. Um, and yeah, that's just something that like I'll be bringing kind of that intention into the work that I'm doing and kind of trying to stay away from more like scientific illustration work that really like isolates a plant from its like relatives and only shows like one flower or one stalk right and like really trying to show like the way that these I mean it, not totally um how they exist in nature but as close as I can in an illustration and really honoring their environment and their home and where they come from hmm. so um and the relationships yeah and the relationships that they have yeah yeah so it's just something that's on my mind as an artist coming into this project and really wanting to make sure that I do it justice <laughs> So you can see why I was so thrilled when I heard Nicole was going to be the illustrator, right? <laughs> the taking all of this and bringing so much life. When I think about, you know, each of these chapters having an illustration like this, even even if a student doesn't read the words, if they simply envelop themselves into an illustration like this, it can change them or or wake them up in another way. 
which I think is such a gift. So I wanted to just add, so Nicole's got the bees here also. You can probably see them on the left and the right, mm -hmm. the pollinators. Some of the other aspects, maybe we'll come off stop share, or should we leave it? I think we could stop sharing. Some of the other aspects that will be coming in is, um, I see some people have lost sound, but it looks like it's come back on. All right, fantastic. Um, is that is a little bit different than the original manuscript is that there are what we're calling pullouts. So as you know, as I was talking about the prologue, I could see a number of you nodding your heads when I was talking about having to put the book down for a little bit and letting all that wisdom that Robin was sharing find its rightful place. And as I was going through the chapters, there was always one or two sentences as I read a page that really stood out so profoundly. And so those will now be on the side of the page and we're just figuring out how that might look. I think it might be like a braid of sweet grass that wraps, wraps around it. We're just figuring out the, the visual draw to those pullouts as well. There are some words that are like, what does that mean? <laughs> And so the glossary will be right there on the page as well. The young people won't or the reader won't have to go to the back of the book to figure out what that word means. On some pages, there'll be reflection thoughts and questions for young people. And at the end of each chapter, there'll be a call to action. And some of those call to actions might be bigger things. And some of them might be big things seen as small things like going for a walk in nature even for just five minutes and paying attention to how that changes us. It makes me think the other day, my daughter and I were in Vancouver and we were riding the ferry to go over and I got up to go over someplace. And when I came back, she said, mama, the back of your jacket's all dirty. Take it off and I'll <laughs> clean it. So she got out the wipes and she was trying to clean it. And she's like, why is it all dirty? I said, well, I just washed it. And I was like, Oh, when I go in the forest, I like lean up against the trees. And she's like, oh, mama. <laughs> <laughs> so those can sometimes be some of the calls to action. I right? like to go to the water or go to uh, the forest or go to the park. And if young people or the reader aren't anywhere near that, is there a plant even that they can sit beside? Right? Can they pull something up on YouTube like a dribbling... Um, stream, something that just um, increases their oxytocin and lowers their cortisol. Mm -hmm. And as we all know, cortisol is one of those key stress hormones that is so prevalent, especially over these last two years. And Robin talks about, and one of the things in my research is I've been watching all the YouTube and um, talks that Robin's been giving so that I can find other ways that she talks about things to weave those into the book that sometimes are a little different than the original manuscript. Because the original manuscript came out in 2013. And so when I've been watching, Robin, I see some of your thinking changing a little bit over the years. So I just weave a little bit of that in. And I honestly can't remember if this is in the manuscript or if I've read this or watched you talk about this but you talk about the forest floor and the first inch and a half of the forest floor is hummus. And that smell of the hummus releases oxytocin and lowers our cortisol, which is why, you know, I get drawn to the forest when I need to uh, almost every day. But I also think about, you know, those of you joining us as educators in your classroom, even, even having plants in your class, and what a gift that can be to students or individuals living in small spaces, having plants, if they, especially if there's no windows also. We think about some of the spaces that the young readers live in and how can we support them to still have green and life and vibrancy around them. So that's been a little bit of our journey so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And... Um, Oh, yeah, I see Kelly Young and a class bring, showing us her plant there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Awesome. Good. Thank you. <laughs> hmm. So I think maybe actually I'll just see, I see you're with us, Robin, and just wondering if there's anything you want to contribute or ask us or comment on before we open the floor to our guests. I'm so moved by those illustrations. A good thing I had my camera off as I was, oh, uh, <laughs> I love, I love the feeling that you're creating, you know, the, for me, the work of the book is to help people love the world more. That's why we are where we are today. We've forgotten how to love the world in the way that the world loves us. And and just that one illustration, you know, opens the heart. Um, and I, I love the way you're thinking about the people who will be holding this book and what they might have out their window, if they have a window, what their different life experiences might be. And, and the prompts to go to help people create a connection that we long for. Mm -hmm. um, and I love that you're incorporating that of saying, and, and that it's physical, you know, um, a book can, you know, it can ignite our imagination and connect us through language, but the powerful images and then your invitation to make it real in your life. Go out and breathe and feel the fact that, you know, our breath is plant breath and our exhalations become plant inhalations. The, the opportunity to give readers a chance to find their own intimate connections with the living world is, is, is powerful. It's medicine. And I thank you for, for thinking about it in that way, thinking so lovingly of, of the readers. Um, mm. So um, I don't have any questions, just a bow of gratitude. Mm. Awesome. Thank you. If individuals who are with us have questions of you, are you open to that as well, Robin? Oh, sure. Okay, thank you. I see um, there's one question coming up already, and that is, when is the release date? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so that will be fall 2022, uh, with the goal being November, the first Tuesday in November 2022. Mm -hmm. um, I have a few questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, um, one question is what is the key age range for the book? I think it's like from, I would say 10 to 12 and that will be depending on the reader, right? We could say 12, but 12 is so different for every single young person, but 10 to 12 up to 99. That's yes. what I'm going to say. <laughs> awesome. Um, another question was, what about adding coloring pages for younger readers? Um, that's a fabulous idea. Thank you for sharing it. Um, <laughs> so um, with the contract, I will actually um, be retaining like copyright of the images. So I'll be thinking of ways that I can share them um, that go alongside the book as well. Um, and I'll just have to keep everyone posted, probably through my Instagram or, you know, website, something like that. One of the um, most exciting illustrations that I'm looking forward to seeing is that Nicole's going to do a full page spread of the Thanksgiving address. And <laughs> I, I, I mean, I cannot wait to unpack, like just to see that and... And I keep encouraging her to do a poster that educators can have <laughs> up in their classroom because I think about... Imagine walking into a classroom or a school or the entrance to your home and the first thing you see is the Thanksgiving address beautifully illustrated. It's like, ah. Yeah. So I'm like super excited about the illustrations. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited mm. for that illustration too because there's just so, there's so much in there that can be like, kind of encapsulated in an image and how an image can tell so many different stories and can share our gratitude in such a different way. Um, 
So I'm excited for that image, too. (laughs) (laughs) I see we have a question from a grade 9 student at Tatla Lake. Um, What was the favorite part of writing this? Do you want to answer that first, Robin? Oh, my gosh. (laughs) My favorite part of writing it, I suppose that depends on the chapter. But you know what I really love in, in the writing process is the sound of the words. Um, you know, as you said, you both were saying that you listened to the book. Well, I kind of did too, because what I, 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 I always speak it aloud to myself. Um, and I want it to feel kind of like a song. Um, and so I like that. I like listening to it and thinking, you know, that's not quite right. I need, I need a different word or I need more and and you have the right rhythm of the sentences and um so i like that process very much of of letting the sound sometimes inform the meaning sometimes when i when i do that when i'm trying to think it doesn't sound quite right what it it's not just the sound that's missing there's an idea that was Mm -hmm. missing too um so i like that part of it and i like all of it i like (laughs) it You know, as as writers and, and, and illustrators, you know, some people talk about how they fear the blank page. Mm-hmm. Um, like, oh, man, not me. I, <laughs> I, I love to stare at that. For me, I write on yellow paper and yellow legal pads, and I just like to have them sitting nearby, like, oh, all of that room to play. <laughs> <laughs> An invitation constantly open for you. It is. Yeah. Thanks for <laughs> and for me, for that young student, um, probably a couple weeks ago, I was editing and working, tinkering away. And I said to my wife, I said, just when I think I've like worked on the most beautiful chapter, I get another one. <laughs> and so I think for me in this writing process, that's been it, is that my own, my own development as a human being I see it's going to make me teary, has changed significantly. I feel like something, something that's been dormant in me, something that's been asleep in me, has woken up. And I think that happens in the creative process a lot for individuals, whether we show what we create to people or not. Just that act of creating and listening and honoring the gifts we've been blessed to, that to me is the greatest joy in writing. So thank you for the young person asking that question at Tatla Lake. There was actually another student who asked a question um, to me. (laughs) Um, um, They would like to know how long it takes for me to work on one of my sketches um and that's a really great question um for this one because there's so many different stages of my sketches and how um I get it to final art like um you know it can vary sometimes a sketch will just come to me so fast and I don't have to play around with composition um kind of like the one that I showed everybody I just in my head I wanted to make this heart-shaped image to kind of show that wonder and love. Um, So that image, it's so far only taken me about like maybe five and a half hours, Um, but it's not completely done yet. And um, illustrating plants always seems to take me quite a bit longer because I really want to make sure I'm, you know, drawing them correctly. So I'm guessing it will be like probably another few hours of work as well to get it Mm. to final art. Um, Yeah, so black and white images are a little bit quicker. And then when you start adding color that it can take a lot longer as well. Yeah. Maybe we can just ask our tech people, we keep um, getting that people can not see both screens, see Nicole and I and Robin at the same time. So I don't know if there's a way. Can you see both of us now? Or all three of us? Oh, all right, Megan says. I can see all three of you. Both of you are spot. Awesome. Oh, great. 
Another um, question. How many sticky notes? This is a question from Justine Woods. How many sticky notes do you estimate you've used? Um, probably six packs. <laughs> <laughs> Because it really helps me. And, and also not just putting the sticky notes up, but taking them off when something's been done is also immensely gratifying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then from Division 16, a grade six class, um, Fraser River Middle School in BC, Canada. Do you have any tips or tricks for people writing or illustrating their own books? Mm. So probably all of us could answer this. <laughs> um, who wants to go first? You go first. Okay. <laughs> well, um, I've never actually illustrated my, my... Well, okay, I've illustrated one children's book before, and that was um, the book that Monique wrote uh, called When We Are Kind. Um, but if you're thinking about illustrating your own story, I would say... Um, planning is really important so for me I like to create these little thumbnails that kind of tell the story because a picture book is telling a story with images right and the images kind of have to carry you through the story and so if you're starting to think about um, writing your own picture book um, and you're thinking about the illustration specifically um, I like to think about like what are all the little stories that you want to put into the illustration mm -hmm. by details um, that will kind of help your reader come through the story with you. Um, and it takes a lot of practice, definitely, um, but always just keep creating, like keep drawing and keep drawing and practicing because um, that's how you get better. Yeah. I was in Prince Edward Island a few years ago and uh, reading My Heart Fills with Con My Heart Fills with Happiness to Grade Ones. And this little person put up their hand and they were so serious and they're like, because I always make clear who the illustrator is. I think that's so important that we do that because sitting in every class or listening to every book are future illustrators. And if we don't acknowledge them, it's like we dismiss the importance. And this little person with their serious face said to me, sometimes the person who draws the pictures tells the story better than the person who writes the words. <laughs> and I was like, yes, that's true. And so the illustrator is a gift to a book, really, in that collaboration together. How about you, Robin? How do ideas come for you for books or stories? I was thinking about that and, you know, I think that one of the things that I really try to do in, in storytelling is to think about the story like a little field trip together. Oh. You know, my favorite place to be and to teach and to think is in the woods. And so, you know, that process when you're in the woods that you first go in and you see big green and then you start to see, oh, that green, that flower, that log, that rock. Oh, the moss is on that rock. Oh, the lichen growing on the moss is in that rock. That process of discovery and refining what you see to reveal the story is just a delight to me. And that's what I try to do for my reader. Rather than tell people mm. things, I want them to go on a field trip with me so that they see mm -hmm. things and they get that sort of catch of your breath like, oh my gosh, I never saw that before. Um, so I, I try to, to have it be sort of a journey um, to, to discovery. Um, so I, I, I get a lot of pleasure out of that and you know when I'm sitting at my desk in the winter it lets me revisit in memory um, <laughs> uh, visit the woods or the water uh, as well yeah when you're covered with snow yeah <laughs> see you gotta come visit in Victoria because we don't you know the green is always there oh <laughs> let's talk in February <laughs> Hmm. I also just want to comment about 
somebody talked in here about Sky Woman and the entrance into braiding sweetgrass and the story about Sky Woman following. And yesterday, Nicole and I were talking about how to bring that to life because that will be an illustration. That story is going to be an illustration. So we were talking yeah. about, will it be an illustration? Mm -hmm. Will it be done like graphic novel style? Mm -hmm. We're not entirely sure yet. Well, actually, you're not yeah. entirely <laughs> sure yet. <laughs> but I definitely like really value your opinion and your approach to the adaptation <laughs> and like you know thinking about like how can this image really welcome people into the book and um what should like be that like kind of striking moment when you look at it you know mm -hmm. and um so it's definitely something I'm thinking about because illustration is just telling stories but with images and um, so it's, it's like, yeah, what's kind of going to be the first kind of impression and feeling that you get. That's kind of what I'm thinking about. Yeah. <laughs> and it really lays down that foundation for the full circle of sweetgrass mm -hmm. with the last mm -hmm. sentence, you know, in, in the manuscript about when, when you're talking to oh, no. Windigo mm -hmm. about, let me tell you about a falling to the earth, right? about a leaf fall and so it's like that full circle and um I love how you did that and I'm I'd be curious if that was intentional it wasn't until I was writing that chapter and I was mm. you know, trying to think about what's windigo medicine how do we heal from that windigo disease and I thought well we have to know that story mm. we have to remember who we are um that we fall into the embrace of the world, that the world is what keeps us alive. Um, and so it's an invitation to see that story again that you heard at the beginning and see it now as a medicine story. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, thank you. You have another question there? Yes, we have a few. Um... Should we do this one? Do you think sure. there will be a learning guide to go along with the book, similar to Speaking Our Truth? Uh, that's a question for the publisher, Learner Books. Mm. I would have a hunch, potentially, in order to support educators and families mm. to use this book. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see... Just as you're looking, Theo from Roxmore Public School in grade six has mm -hmm. question. In adapting the book from the original, who do you feel has the bigger job? Oh, thank you for that question. I think we both do, right? Like when you think about that little person in Prince Edward Island who said that about the illustrator, that sometimes they bring the book to life in a different way than the person who writes the words. I think that both of us bringing our own ways of bringing the adaptation to life um, is a gift. It doesn't really feel like a work or a job. But I think both of them equally bring the vibrancy to this book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for your quest question, Theo. Mm -hmm. um, I have another question that's for me. Um, can you tell us what other arts you practice and are learning, Nicole, and have they influenced your illustrations? Um, yeah, so illustration is one part of my arts practice, and it's something that I'm rather new to, to be honest. Um, but I've been an artist my whole life, and I, um, you know, did my undergrad at UVic studying painting and installation, and then... I just finished my Master of Fine Arts at OCAD University in Toronto, um, largely focusing on Indigenous futurisms, which is uh, kind of like a form of uh, native sci-fi, but instead of being like grounded in colonial worldviews, it's grounded in like Indigenous story and culture and traditions. And uh, a lot of my work kind of focuses on telling uh, Navajo stories and Navajo creation stories um, through kind of these installation based pieces. So um, in terms of design, um, 
I've definitely had a lot of practice of um, building in uh, different kinds of stories and creation stories from my community and translating them into these like images that can um, make up a whole piece. Um, um, there's a question from Kelly Indian. Robin, did you do field journaling as part of your process? You know, <laughs> interestingly, I don't. Um, as a scientist, I do all kinds of field journaling when I'm doing my science work. But um, when I'm really doing creative work, not that science isn't creative, it is different kind of of, of creativity. Um, I want to be so present with the other beings there that I I don't I don't really journal in the field because it's a kind of barrier between me and mm. and, and what I'm seeing and experiencing. Um, so I I know a lot of writers do. Um, what I do is <laughs> have um, little scraps of paper all through my life that I'm walking, right? Usually it's when I'm walking, not really in the woods, but just like exercise walks. I think, oh, I know how to say that. And of course I don't have a journal with me, but I might have a bill. So I write all <laughs> over the bill and, and you know, or, or my school papers. And then, then I have to collect them all. <laughs> say That was a good idea. Uh, so I, I should be more disciplined about it, but I, I really, I really like to be very present. Um, and uh, and maybe I'm a slow processor. I just have to um, let all of the world soak in, and then later it comes out on the back of an envelope. <laughs> I love that because I've got slips of paper all over the house too. My wife is committed to that. Yeah. yeah, in pockets and on the back of restaurant receipts. And yeah, do you have that also from when you're out an idea comes? Oh, yeah. I mostly do it on my phone, though. <laughs> I have like a note section. And um, if anything like comes up, I'm always like writing it down right away. But I've taken to started carrying a little notebook with me everywhere I go because um I'm very forgetful <laughs> so. well and I feel like like it's a gift that comes right and if yeah. I don't capture it it goes to somebody else which is just fine yeah. but I like to capture what I can <laughs> <laughs> yeah mm. I find it mostly happens when um I'm like literally right about to fall asleep mm -hmm. and I'm like just in between waking and dreaming and it's like that moment yeah yeah um Let's have one more question one and more then we'll questions? begin to wrap up. Okay, so from grade nine students. Um, what is the most challenging part of the writing process? Oh, I would say, other than this project, to be really honest, getting my butt in the chair. <laughs> that just getting to my desk and starting to write. Once I'm there and I start, it's like, why was I putting this off? And sometimes it's also that I talk into my phone. That's my other way of capturing because I feel like I'm more of a storyteller than a writer. I'm not a trained writer. I don't, I haven't gone to school to write. I tell stories and my dad used to tease me when I, I was a kid. He'd say, now Monique, did that really happen? Or is that just one of your stories? <laughs> and often it was one of my stories. Okay. So I think that is, for me, my greatest challenge often is getting my butt in the chair to write. How about you, Robin? What's your greatest challenge? A place, a place where I often get stuck is that I know, like, the ideas that I want to share, but I know that those ideas need to be carried by a story. They need to be carried by an image, and sometimes I just can't really write down, write even the, the core of what I want to say, unless I know who's going to carry that. Um, mm -hmm. So then I'll think, oh, um, I'll wrestle with it. And then suddenly it becomes clear, oh, it's a migrating swallow whose perspective we need on this. And once I have, and once I have the carrier of, of the story, then it all seems to 
flow. Um, but until I do, um, it's no good. <laughs> <laughs> ah, how about you? Yeah, for me, um, my hardest part is also getting into the chair. <laughs> um, it's actually just like starting because sometimes like when I'm working with images or have all these ideas in my head of images that I want to include in an illustration like sometimes I get a little overwhelmed by all of the details that I want to have and I'm kind of like oh my gosh how am I ever going to do that and I kind of lose this trust in myself mm. um, but I find that like the best way to get through that is to like hone in on one detail and be like you know what, I really want to draw this one flower right now, or I really want to draw this one character, and I'll just do that. And then it's like, from that point, then I can build off of it. Um, so that's kind of how I approach that. Yeah. <laughs> and we were talking yesterday that also, once we start, it's like time just disappears. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Until there's such a pain in our butt or we have to go to the bathroom so bad or something. It's like, oh, my back's like, like uh-uh. four, four hours later or five hours later. And I think that's always, yeah. you know, especially for the young people joining us today, that's always a signal to you that when that time goes like that, that that's part of your gift. Mm -hmm. That however, you know, we all have been blessed with our unique gifts and walking the planet. This is a teaching I received from Dr. Lee Brown was walking the planet at any one time there are no two human beings who have been blessed with the same bundle of gifts mm -hmm. and that's why we're all important and not from a place of ego but that we've all been brought here to contribute to the wellness of the world and when when you notice that time has gone like that that's a clue for you that something in that is part of your wonder and part of your joy and to pay attention to that so we've come to the close of our time. There's still these questions about when is the book coming out? So again, fall 2022, uh, early November. Um, I think that there will be a bit of a reveal of the cover, maybe in January or February, and a, <laughs> maybe an inside chapter as well. We've seen an inside chapter in the design team at Learner is, wow, they're just bringing your work to such beauty, Robin. Oh my gosh. And for our young readers and those who will read the book. It, yeah. So much gratitude to the team at Learner Books for all that you're doing to bring this book to life as well. And to each of you for joining us today and Robin, especially for joining us for, you know, the call and, um, and also being the bridge when we disappeared for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> And for listening to whatever message you received to write this book all those years ago, much gratitude because it it's medicine and it's the medicine that we've needed since 2013 and still today. And it's so apparent with it being, you know, on the top five of the New York Times bestseller list that it is resonating with people. That's one signal that is resonating. I think the other signals are how people are changing their lives as a result of reading. It's a very important signal of the importance of what you've created. So I raise my hands and offer much gratitude for your contribution with Braiding Sweetgrass, with all of your books, with all, I mean, people Google you and they can have that, your voice and your teachings playing in the background when they do dishes, when they fold laundry, when they just need an uplift. Mm -hmm. So thank you. It's an honor to be on the planet with you at the same time. Oh, and with um, the two of you as well, with all of you. And I love, thank you for that honoring of listening to the gift, because that's really, I think we can all attest that things are given to us. And our job is to transmit them, right? Mm -hmm. that, that these things are the world speaking through us. The, the lamb speaking through us and it's a a great privilege to be listening mm -hmm. thank you so much mm -hmm. so many blessings to all of you thank you for joining us today and mm -hmm. may there be beauty to the left of you may there be beauty to the right of you may there be beauty below you may there be beauty above you may there be beauty behind you and may there be beauty in front of you 
Um, I talk to us, all my relations. Yeah, thank you, everybody. <laughs>